You're listening to That Great Mank Pod. Greater Manchester's community podcast. Top one out. Hi and welcome to the second Manx Spirit Arbery Festival special on that great Manx pod. Damien and I chat with Umrana Farouk, the kind of person who makes it seem that there are actually more than 24 hours in a single day. Councillor for Berry East, founder of the groundbreaking Bain Project, works for the NHS, a mum to five children. Wow. Berry, you are very lucky to have her. You can follow Umrana at B A M E. P R O J E C T. Welcome, Councillor. Councillor Fruit. Uh, could you introduce yourself? Tell us who you are and what amazing things you do out there. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Damien and Paul. My name's uh, Umrana Farouk. Um, I'm um, the local councillor for East Ward and also the Deputy Cabinet Member for Communities in uh, Berry Council. Um, I also work for the NHS at um, Fairfield General Hospital on the a and Department, and also I run my non-profit community group called the BAME Project. BAME standing for Believe in Yourself, Achieve Your Goals, Maintain Resilience and Exceed Your Targets. Wow, so you're, you're very busy and very active in, uh, in Berry. I am. <laughs> So how do you find the time to do all these things? Uh, to be honest, it's um, the passion to work with the community that really drives me. And um, uh, I just find time to do everything. And because I'm a really organised person, I do make time for everything and make sure I do sort of fill in the gaps that are out there. How, uh, just in, I know that uh, your daughter helps you with your uh, IT and various she bits of and she does a fantastic job as well, certainly on social media. So how how, how many daughters have you got? I've got four daughters. And right. Son, and they've got a little boy as well. Four daughters and one boy? Yeah. Right. Um, well, it was challenging when they were younger because um, mm. um, when they were growing up, they had uh, different disabilities, um, varying from um, atopic eczema to problems with the kidney and one of my daughters was on the spectrum of autism. So right. I had a tough time when they were growing up, to be honest, and I didn't get much support. Um, but um, put it this way, uh, I did have like the show start who helped me a lot, um, which was a great initiative um, in them days. Uh, but right. there's no show start now, but they really supported me in different aspects, like um, looking after my health and well-being and um, encouraging me to come to groups. Uh, for mental and health well-being because it does come to a point where you feel really low uh, low esteem and um, um, it helps to go to groups and build that resilience back up again and get that support. Do you think that lack of support kind of pointing you because you're a counsellor now supporting and helping yeah. other people do you think that was a big part of you making that jump from well to be a counsellor because it you know it, it can't be the easiest uh, it can't be the easiest role trying to keep everyone happy <laughs> no it's not to be honest with you Paula I think having that passion and that um that empathy to support people in the community who come uh, who come from all different walks of life I mm. mean um having my life skills I mean I like to share them and support people who might have been in a situation that I've been already through so um I like to you know give them my if I could give them advice or if I can support them which way to go sort of thing where to get the help from you know um and being a counsellor I think that comes all in it as well. So direct to people on signposting where they can get um, access to help from. How long have you been a councillor? Uh, I just recently got elected in May this year. So quite a newbie, but um, I have actually previously worked for the um, the previous MP for Berry. Right. Uh, I've got all my um, experience from. So um, uh, I did a lot of casework then, you see. So that's what, um, which, which helped me be in this uh, council role, doing the casework. So, so how, just explain to me then how 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 it works as a counsellor. So, if anybody, I mean, I, I, you know, I think it's one of these things that people don't really realise how much work some counsellors do, and I'm including you in that, and and uh, and what their day to day kind of role is in terms of supporting the community. So, so can, can, um, can you give us a brief idea of how how that works for you? Yeah, sure, Paul. So, even before I got elected, I had people coming with issues. Um, so, I did actually contact the. Um, the council at that time so uh, what we do is um, we take details and find out what the issue is 
and find out who is the who, who which officer is in Berry Council or any council um, to find out who can resolve that issue or who can actually help. So what we're trying to do is make rep representation of the constituent and uh, get the support for them or get the answers for them. Uh, sometimes it might be not something that they wanted. Sometimes the answers are not something that they expect. You know, yeah. because but what we do is make the representation. We do our part by making that representation and putting their word out. So we let like their voice basically and um, mm. bring their voice to the very council. And how, how many? I mean, I'm not being. Well, I am being a little bit nosy, if I'm honest. How, how many do, do you have to do? A certain number of days, a certain number of hours, or um, no? Being a councillor, you don't have like set hours. Right, um, it's like being a parent. I yeah, it's very much so. I mean, I'll get contacted by phone, by email on the streets or when we're doing like street surgeries um, or through social media, you get contacted on different different ways. And then uh, we just take the details and then try and support our community as much as we can in different ways. So so there's no end time then? So you, no. you, you <laughs> Right. Well, I, I, listen, that's that's pretty stressful, pretty much like what, what me and Damien do. You know, there isn't any switching off time, and that's and, and that's the big issue with social media, especially is that people can get hold of you uh, and mobile phones. They can get hold of you, of you at any time, and the thing is, you don't always have to respond. But if you if you're the kind of person that you obviously are, and something comes through, you're going to respond to it, aren't you? Yeah. No matter when it comes through. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Jimmy. Uh, I was just going to say it's even more so with yourself because not only are you doing the that. As a counsellor, so that's you know that's one role. You've also got the community group. You know, yeah. do you say that's CIC? Um, we are looking forward to become a CIO of the BIM project. Um, but what we're kind of trying to do is, because um, sometimes when case work does come through um, regarding uh, women with mental health and um, feeling isolated. I do direct them to different groups, so not just only the group that I run, but other groups that are available in Bury. Mm -hmm. uh, but if they find that they trust one group than the other one or see a familiar face, they tend to go to that group sort of thing. So, I mean, yeah. I welcome lots of different people from different walks of life to our group. And the nature of our group is uh, building that trust. And um, we've also got different agencies working with ourselves, um, like SafeNet, who support um, victims of domestic violence and abuse. So um, I think we do get a lot of referrals from that as well i think that's really important and a lot of people listening to this won't understand it. it's, it's the same with the casework as a counselor and the the work me and paul do it out in the community running our charity and what you do you know running your community groups it's giving and you've just hit the nail on the head it's giving people choice because you know believe it or not some people don't like me um paul's <laughs> laughing now already but You've got to give people that opportunity and, and also knowing your limitations to a degree. You know, if I picked up a case of domestic violence, I'd know how to triage it. I'd know how to ask the right questions, but I'm not the best person to deal with that. That's not one of my sort of specialist fields. I'd contact you, I'd contact Sahaley, I'd contact, but it's knowing it's been part of that wider network, isn't it? You yeah, know. definitely. Yeah, because sometimes we don't all have the answers, and it was good to have the networking. So we do know if we don't know the answer, at least we can actually forward them to somebody else or signpost them to somebody else. Um, but sometimes it might be that uh, they want somebody else to come to to your place where they feel secure. So like uh, um, where we are based in Newtons, um, is we have created like a safe space. So if they wanted to speak to to somebody, um, I'm I'm happy to get different organisations into our work, our place, and then they can have that discussion where they feel safe. And what issue as a well, you can use which or both as a counsellor and as as the work you do out in the community over the last six twelve months, I know we've all you know had to adapt and change and new things. What are the big issues that have coming up within? the very area that you've noticed? I think the isolation of people feeling lonely um, and that's driving people with mental health issues. Um, and have you so, seen, a, and something I've noticed a lot of, I've seen a massive rise in domestic violence and people seeking help and support because the groups that I know have been massively overrun. Mm. Yeah, that's true. But like I said, not many people want to open up, you see, so it's actually building that trust, really. So people will access your group, but it will take a bit of time why they want to access or how they want the help sort of thing. You know, they need to build that um, trust and um, 
and friendship in, within your group. Um, I mean, obviously, the pandemic's had hit us all really hard, um, and it's affected us all in different different ways. Mm. And um, domestic violence and abuse being on the um, high, and we have actually done something about it. I've actually um, contacted um, a friend who's um, a self defence instructor. And uh, we have actually applied for some funding through Berry Council for the isolation and loneliness funds. And, and an element that we did put in there was the um, free self-defence courses for ladies only. Mm. And because uh, Berry East is a deprived area, um, it's, it's something that will, would it be affordable for um, for the women. So what we've done is use the funding um, to provide free, uh, free self-defence courses for women. And we've done our first course of 15 to 20 women, and it's been really successful. And we have actually already booked in another three with the lead, with the instructor. And uh, to be honest with you, um, I have got a waiting list for the next lot of ladies that want to come on to that. And that's we do fantastic. Have... And that's one of the things, I know we spoke a couple of times before we've done this yeah. podcast, and one of the things um, me and Paul always say, we want to put things into action. You know, we don't want to just attend meetings. We don't yeah. can't be bothered Definitely. with that anymore. Um, and one of the things we love about you is you're getting stuff done. You know, you're actually putting things into action and making it happen. You know? Yeah, because it's all like having meetings and planning things, but action say more than words, to be honest. Like, you know, that's how I see things. And if there is a gap, just go out and fill it. You know, don't just wait on it. Don't just wait for somebody else to do it. Just get stuck into it. But to be honest with yourselves, um, it took me three years to get such funding for such course to be delivered. And now it's needed most, but I did try uh, applying for different fundings, but I've been really unsuccessful, which is a shame, really, because self-defence is a life skill for anybody and any, everybody, like, you know, so learning a life skill is more important than anything else. So um, I'm really pleased that Council have seen that I was really passionate about this initiative. And um, hopefully, I hope other uh, towns and uh, other cities will actually take this on as well and look at uh, the gap and um, provide this um, service for women. Um, especially with the high rates of domestic violence and abuse, having that um, having that life skill, it makes you more confident and more resilient, you know. So, um, I mean, what I really, really... Listen, we have a... You know, we, we said this before, we have this two-meeting rule where if anything's going to take longer than two meetings to get anything done or start anything getting done, we walk away or we, you know, we shuffle away <laughs> depending, you know, at our age. But, you know, we, we that, that wasn't an issue... <laughs> When we first spoke to you, I think we've been speaking within 20 minutes, and I just said, right, okay, well, it's not gonna go, it's not gonna go on two meetings before we realize that A, Damien and I really, really love the stuff that you're doing because it's it, it is different. I mean, the self-defense stuff is, and I'm you know, I'm not other people may be trying it uh, or maybe thinking about it, but you've done it, and it's not something I would have thought that would have been um that would have been available in your community if if i'm quite honest and we spoke about that before um but i love the fact that you do all these different types of events and or you know events is is quite a grand thing i know you do with the big events but you you create situations where people can get together and have a laugh yeah so they can they can they can be creating stuff so there's a lot of art space stuff you do they can fight each other (laughs) You know, or, you know, and and get that kind of energy out. But more importantly, it's a place where they can speak to each other and speak to you and what issue. And and that's the big thing that I've learned, not coming from a charity background, is that you know when people have got these, I've got any any kind of issues. If you if you can put them in a position where they feel comfortable telling you what their problems are. It's, it's massive once they make that breakthrough and say, listen, I'm, I'm struggling and I, and I want, you know, I want help. Yeah. And you're in a position then to say, I mean, you know, nine times out of 10, personally, you can offer that help, but you'll know where you can, where you can point them through to and support them on that. Um, and, and that's, it's going, you back, know, it's going back to what you said earlier um, about building trust. I mean, you know, you've told us about the Bollywood Zumba and I just, mm. I'd love if them two classes got mixed up. That'd be really funny. Um, but, any, you know, the arts events, uh, the martial arts. <laughs> I've just got that. Sorry, I was, I was miles away there. Comes and teaches the Bollywood Zumba yeah, class. Bollywood Zumba. But it's, 
people exercising, dancing together, and you joining in with them, and you know, and, and creating that, and then afterwards, just them hanging back and saying, "Actually, can I ask you about this?" Because they've took part with you. One of them, you know, you yeah. you've not distanced yourself from your community no. by doing that. Do you know what I mean? No. I mean, I'm not. I mean. There's a professionalism, yeah. There's a, there's a professionalism and there's like being friends with people, yeah. So they don't see me as a professional. They see me as someone who's, who's ready to listen to, you know, so mm. someone who's, who's going to have a listening ear. So um, because I join in the stuff that they do, like we have a laugh and we have a joke sort of thing. And, you know, I mean, I say that we all have problems, like, you know what I mean? And then we do sort of share. I mean, most recently, like with that uh, loneliness and isolation funds, we're doing different activities like the social eating. Not all we just sitting down and having a, having a meal um we actually talking you know talking about different mm. issues about food about buying food how expensive it is buying the ingredients is it cheaper to buy, get fast food or you know different different things that we talk about and what's healthy what's not healthy so we're having all these conversations within the social eating and one of the ladies said that instead of having the same curry and chapatis why don't we have food around the world so after the day one, it's like, okay, that's what we're going to do then. So we started doing food around the world. So the first day we had like the authentic Asian food. So the next month we have in, we had actually Afghani food. And the next right. month we'll have Chinese food. You know, why don't we try everything like, you know, but I mean, I'm never, you know, um, thinking of you know, any suggestions. I'll take them on board because that's what Well, what about Brit- a, a nice, Brit- nice British food like chicken tikka masala? That's not <laughs> British. <laughs> Chicken chips. <laughs> with chips yeah half rice half chips no I, listen the, the thing that gets me is when i see the pictures that you post on social media i mean there's some really heavy situations that you're dealing with some really serious situations mm. but there's always and i've said this to you before you know on social media and i've said it to, to your face it's the sm- there's always smiles People always look, it's not like, oh no, well, you know, we've been dragged out and we go, you're like, oh, the walks you do on a Sunday, love like it. this weekend. And everyone's smiling and you're thinking, if they, if that was my kids <laughs> and I'd suck them out on a Sunday afternoon to go for a long walk, they, they wouldn't Sunday be morning. smiling. That's Sunday, like well, even worse morning. Sunday morning. Where's the Wi Fi? There's no Wi Fi, you know. But the, it's just the smiles. So you can tell that people are really comfortable and, you know, and and just enjoying themselves. But again, you don't know what's going on behind the scenes, and it and it and it could be weeks and weeks and weeks before that person who's had that smile on the face every week mm. actually turns around and says, "Well, the real story is, um, you know, this is this is my issue." But it's it's creating that situation where they can do that, and that's really special. That's really special because mm. um, it's sacred space. Talk about it. Yeah, you know, I've always said when I worked on the streets for the homeless and you build up that time and you you get that instinct you just there's like a tingle in the air you know and you know that it's one of those moments where somebody wants to tell you something and it that to me is the point where you've got to listen you know yeah. instead of trying to fix or trying to change things or jumping in you know to give them your piece of advice to me the most powerful time when you when you get that tingle when you get when you're in that sacred space uh, yeah. is just to be calm and listen to what that person's got to tell you. Yeah, because what one of my good friends told me is that um, it might be like just one moment when somebody tell, is ready to tell you about what they're going through um, and never dismiss that one moment, you know, because that, mm. that person must have built a lot of courage to tell you something, you know, make time for that one moment, which I always do. So if anyone wants, wants to say something to me like, oh, they said, can I have a quick word? I, w- I would always, you know, take it really seriously, you know, and make that time, no matter what I'm doing. But it's got to be good for you as well, to, you know, because we've all got our issues, we've all got our problems, and yeah. and and that's the thing that I think people really, really missed is the fact that, you know, during lockdown is that, I mean, you can still speak to people, but it's being with someone and that, that you know, this would probably be a different interview if we were all sat in the same room. Mm. It's you know, connection. Yeah, it's, it's, that, it's that connection. absolutely connection, yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, this sort of, the same group has helped me through my mental health as well because um, I lost my father early on this year and um, it came to a point, uh, it was like a week before it was the elections, but um, I still... My friends did say to me, like, you know, Mariana, what would your dad want? You know, my dad would want me to be successful. So I came out, did my campaigning, and 
um, I was successful and became the councillor for East Ward. And um, but despite that, the group that I ran the BAME project, the ladies still wanted my support, so I continued the um, the BAME group, uh, the coffee morning, and they were supporting me as well, saying, "Umrana, you yeah. know, we're with you." So it's it's a two way thing, you know. I mean, I'm supporting them; they're supporting me. So like. Any Monday, it's like even bank holidays, we're open. <laughs> you know, we don't have any rest. But uh, if I said that, right, we're not going to open on Monday. It's like, oh, no, don't say that, I'm Rana. <laughs> yeah. The easiest I know. thing, especially when you're going through something as difficult, uh, and I was sorry, you know, I'm sorry to hear that. But I bet your dad's really proud of you, you know, no yeah. matter what. And he, he'll have been there with you, you know. But it's that's the time that you could easily just switch off, you know, go into your shell, disappear. And I found that um, when I was working in prisons, and I shared this with people all the time, I was struggling with my weight, and uh, I was I was going through a weight loss thing, and I was coaching, mentoring people in the prisons, and they were the most supportive people of me through that time. You know, I'd be walking through one of the wings, and one, the lads would stop me and go, "Hey, you're looking really good, Damo. Keep it up. Have you thought of doing this, or have you thought of doing that?" Mm. And those. Those lads in prison really pushed me through that period. And, I mean, I've put a bit on, well, put a lot on since lockdown, but I lost five stone with their support, you know, and it, it wasn't the doctor. It wasn't my family. It wasn't friends even. It was the lads in prison, you know, and it was going back to that because you made that connection, you mm-hmm. know, because I was supporting them. They wanted to give something back to me. Yeah, to do, yeah. Can you tell us about, because I, I want people to know about the, the things that you're doing, uh, and the story that made me smile is the, if, if you want to tell it, I think you should, because it's a great story, is, is with regards to riding the bike. <laughs> yes, so um, as um, coming up, getting brought up in the, a Pakistani household, it's um, a bit of a stigma uh, for girls to ride a bike. Mm. Um, and my brother used to have one, and I used to say to mum, I want to ride a bike, and mum used to say, it's not a girl's thing. I was like, but I want to r- learn to ride it. So I um, had that passion in me since that childhood. And the most recently in the local park, they were teaching uh, Learn to Ride um, uh, initiative from T- TFGM. And I booked myself in and my daughter's in as well, because I thought, right. you know what, something that I couldn't do younger, I bet my daughters wanted to do as well. Um, so I thought, let's go together. So um, we went to the first session, really, really nervous. And um, after the first one and a half hour, cl- after the class was ending, uh, 10 minutes before, I actually managed to ride a bike. And that <laughs> for me was like amazing, you know. Um, I felt so flying, honestly. I thought I had wings. <laughs> and my daughters as well. They, uh, one of my daughters um, picked it up as well really quickly, and it was like a game changer for me. <laughs> um, I, I, have there's you, so have many you... benefits, though. You know, yeah. riding a bike. I mean, somebody said to me, um, a gentleman called Jonathan Walking Walking Stone Walkingston. Um, he did mention to me that you know, what would you do if you could ride a bike? As I'll go to shops on a bike. You know, I just go around the block on a bike. You know, just to be healthy. And I thought it'll take me two minutes to go to like the local shop rather than, you know, going in my car um, to buy bread or something like, you know, and uh, I, rather, I love to go on a bike. Did you, did it, you sh- I mean, I'm sure you did share that with the group in, in terms of the, how would it help you? Because I know we've talked about this as well. If if you were to get some bikes provided by somebody listening to this podcast for your group. That would be amazing. How many do you need? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, don't be shy. How many bikes do you need? A dozen would be fine. Right. Okay. But yeah, because I want to encourage other women as well uh, to ride a bike. Because I mean, like I said, there's a stigma around women uh, riding a bike. I mean, you don't see many being women out there riding a bike on the street, sort of thing. So I want to break them barriers because there's no cultural. It's called well, there's no cultural uh, evidence to say that you can't ride a bike. I mean, I if you saw my pictures on Twitter. I was wearing my uh, outfit my Pakistani outfit the Shalawakamis riding a bike you know there's no nothing that says that you can't ride a bike wearing Shalawakamis or whatever you don't have to have a set outfit that you have to ride a bike you know I had my hijab on had my helmet on everything you know so you don't have to compromise with anything at all you know oh, no, you were all fashion. kitted up I saw the <laughs> I saw the pictures and I did think hey. yeah and listen I, I just thought it was uh, I think it's a really and that, that's the kind of story that everyone can relate to 
you know, everyone's learned to ride a bike. Well, not everyone's learned to ride a bike, obviously, but I mean, everyone's had to go through that process and fell off. Um, yes, uh, I did yeah. fall off and hurt my leg, yeah, but that didn't stop me. I carried on. I didn't think it would do. <laughs> It'd take more than that to stop you, wouldn't it? I know. But yeah, yeah no, it not only that, it's somebody walking through the park and seeing you riding past. I think that's a powerful image. You yeah. know, and it's, it's, I hate the word, um, you know, I do, I do a lot of, sort of um, multicultural projects and work with other community groups and stuff like that. I hate the word acceptance. You know what I mean? It, it, why should it be about acceptance? It should just be normality, you know, but anything that breaks that, to get people to think, you know, I mean, the Black Lives Matter stuff, that was, you know, people had to sit and think and, re, you know, think about the what had happened and words they used and, the way they thought about stuff. I did it. Paul did it. I mean, we we taught at length about things, you know, um, being brought up, what how things had changed massively, different terminology mm. um, and things like that. And I, I was dead proud at the time to say, I mean, I'm a big Manchester City fan and I, I'm in the roughest area and I don't hear any of that around me. I mean, I'd challenge it if it did, yeah. but I don't hear it. You know, and I, I think that's fantastic. But you've got to, I just like, I think the idea of somebody, some person walking through the park and going to the mate, <laughs> just just seeing an Asian lady riding through the park on a bike, I don't think I've ever seen that before, you know, and, and getting a conversation, you know. Well, that's the ethos of everything we do, which is about sticking smiles on the faces and, and not for any other reason that that would make me smile because you just go, all right, yeah. You know, you think you've seen everything. <laughs> and it's 25 Asian women riding down on bikes, bimming the horns. I just think it's... Very brilliant. I mean, actually, um, we did have some good news this week. Um, apparently, we have been offered um, to have, like, a bike library in the local park. Um, right. But I think there's a bit of a process for that. But it'd be brilliant to get more and more women coming to the park, just pick up a bike and just ride it in the park, you know. Mm. Like you would, and um, because uh, most recently uh, we've had some funding um, through uh, GM, and we've got like new B lines as well to make it more uh, accessible to use a bike and walk as well. What, so, are, what, are, B, B lines? what are B lines? So it's like so it's um it's like uh, like bike like bike lanes. So it's accessible oh, right. for, yeah, for yeah. using bikes. This so is the the strategy that's um, Andy Burnham, Andy Burnham, and uh, the, who's the cyclist. There's a cycle. There's also that, that lady we were talking about the other week um, bu- 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 that we both follow and she put some stuff up there because we both Eve said, Holt, yeah, is it? yeah, we, well, if you're listening, Eve, because Eve's he's quite influential in that, in that, isn't he? Yeah. Isn't she? So, you know, we could, uh, we need to get into her ribs. Yeah. See what she oh, can well, do. Actually, I need to send her my story, actually, because I did say yeah. that one. Uh, but I will actually email her and send my story to her because um, it is. I mean, my story might change other people's minds as well about, you know what, culture. I mean, you know, you, either, you don't have to not do something because of culture. Like, you know what I mean? It doesn't mm. stop you. You can break cultural barriers. Well, that, that's what, you know, we'll do that for festival week. You know, and you know, people listen to this 20 years in the future. So it doesn't matter when we had the festival, but, you know, we've got the festival next week. Uh, and that's exactly what we want to do. We want to rate, we want to raise something that people aren't expecting. And just make them think, all right, okay, yeah. So, you know, we'll, we'll definitely, I mean, you know, you, you're going to be a big part of the festival anyway. Um, we said that because we want to highlight what you're doing because it's it's just, you know, it's A stuff. I um, need a video of you on the bike. <laughs> no, we have. You've sent those videos through, which I'm going to, um, I haven't, it's been crazy this week, but we'll, I'm putting them all together uh, over the next couple of days for when we start, but... Um, this may this may go in the podcast. It may not because I'm, I'm going on a bit here. But uh, but yeah, that we want that to be uh, a big part of the festival is is for people to look at what you're doing, and it will encourage other people uh, to to do stuff in their own communities. You know, yeah. whatever whatever that is, and you know, you've got a really good blue blueprint the way that you do it, which is um, do everything and anything. Try it <laughs> once. Well, there is lots of other things. I mean, I've spoken to um, here. We had um, the Berry Birds uh, Festival, yeah, and um, it was like part of the art of cultural art of culture. But what I was a bit disappointed about is that um, 
it wasn't very inclusive. Mm. Um, therefore, I have got an idea which I hope to execute next year. I forgot some funding. So what I want to do is do a, like an Eid Mailer at the Birds and invite all the whole diverse community to come and enjoy. Because Welcome. There's lots, things, <laughs> there's lots of things that happen in Manchester. So I want, because uh, we've got space here in Berries. So why not do in Berry? Why go to um, Manchester where we can do something in our own town? Yeah. So um, I want to have like um, a need mailer here in Burst Park for all the community to come and enjoy and see the diverse community that we actually live in. Mm. Oh, that's the best way to do it. The best way to do it is the, I mean, we, we, again, we've talked about, I think we've talked about this is the first time we, we actually um, were introduced to each other is, you know, and Damien always says this and he's absolutely right. The best way to get people interested in anything is through the bellies, you know, and and, and getting them trying out different foods from Food, around the world. And uh, are the, yeah. the three best things to bring people mm. together and cultural sharing. Um, and experiencing and and inspiring people to take notice and ask questions of is course. food, music, and art are the, are the three best things. Yeah, and that's what reduces hate crime as well because you have a better understanding of different cultures, you know. And re- most recently, there's um, a mini fair here um, near uh, Matalan, and it's only like limited rides, and it's like there should be more rides. <laughs> And it's like, and he goes, do you know what? You set up a good event and I'll bring all the rides that you want, you know. So I thought, do you know, right, all right, we'll do an Eid Mail at Burst Park. More space, yeah. I will do a massive fair and we'll have food, we'll have music, we'll have a stage, we'll have everything, like, you know, let's do it, so. Well, it, everything shouldn't have to be central. And, you know, it's, again, it's the way, you know, the, the another part of the ethos for the charity is that, you know, not everything should be central Manchester. Mm. In fact, nothing should be said to Manchester. We should, because, you know, we should be taking it out into the communities. Yeah, of course. And the communities should be taking it out into other communities. And hopefully this is what we can try and, you know, do with the festival, you know. So when we go to Stockport, uh, which is after um, after Bury, you know, as, as some of the legacy stuff that we'll do from Bury, and hopefully you'll be part of that, we can introduce what you're doing into other boroughs throughout the city and say, well, how good's that? <laughs> it's the whole reason these festivals. I mean, when when we r- sat down and planned it and and wrote the application and thought about it. I mean, the, two blokes from Central Manchester. You know, Paul's from Moston and I'm from Clayton. And it's like, no, we're not going to focus on Central Manchester. There's too much happens there. And we did know Paul through the arts and through his business contacts. Me through community contacts. There was fantastic stuff going out in the boroughs. But they weren't given the opportunity. They weren't given the chance to show the rest of Greater Manchester what they were doing, you know. And I have this argument because, you know, I work with lots of different community groups. And it's like, why are you just staying in one area? You know, the people that I know down in Moss Side, it's like, I need your help over in Moston. There's more issues over there. You know, Moss Side's okay now. But come over there, oh, no, if it's not happening in the hood, I'm not bothered. It's like, hang on a minute. A community activist take goes out into those areas yeah. and takes that inspiration with them. I'm sure you will. In fact, I've no yeah. doubt whatsoever, given the opportunity, that yeah. you take the work you're doing right across GM, you know. Yep. What, what, what do you really, today, if, if, you know, we had a magic wand, what, what do you really want? to do with the Bain project what's your like your your really big idea for it um to sustain it um to keep it going and um helping more and more people uh and making the connections uh with other community groups um and just be like um like a like a role model really for other you know towns and cities to do the similar groups and it's actually been inside in the grassroots of the communities rather than just doing like, you know, a big thing, but be actually in those grassroots and support the people that would never get the support elsewhere sort of thing. And what it is, like I said, I'm working closely with East Bay because it's the most deprived area where people don't have much income. And we've got a lot of asylum seekers and refugees here as well. So, you know, for them, I mean, giving them like a free um, activity to do, it's, it's gold for them, you know, um, like That's at the moment, like we're doing like the social eating, like, I mean, it might be the, the main nutritious meal that they would be having on that day, you know. So it's looking at the wider picture sort of thing and supporting everybody, but looking at, you know, 
the most needy, I think. Just for oh. clarification, because um, obviously me and Paul know because we spoke to you before, but what does what does the BAME project stand for and what is it that you do, what groups and stuff do you work with? So um, the BAME project actually means um, believe in yourself, achieve your goals, maintain your resilience and exceed your targets. Um, the aims of the group is to raise awareness of health and well-being, both mentally and physically. Um, the activities do they vary and we make some more up. We have new new initiatives as we go along. Um, so we started off with like um, a chai chat and chill, like a coffee morning. We just sit around and um, have a cup of tea and cake and then we just talk about different issues. Um, we get guest speakers in talking about different like like um, support for unpaid carers. Um, we've had workshops around like Black Lives History Month and um, around hate crime. Uh, activities we celebrate different um, uh, religious festivals so um, we've done Eid uh, festival we've done a Christmas one and we're doing a um, Diwali one soon um, what else do we do we do a walking group uh, lots of social events and we do a lot of um, raising awareness of uh, domestic violence and abuse and trying to get the message to people out there that there is help there discreetly we do um, send out uh, leaflets and in we've got like little mug hampers that we've made and we are giving the mugs out in the community with a leaflet inside that's in, interpreted in a different language as well that says if you require any help just um discreetly ask for that help fantastic i just thought it was good i like the way that you've used the bame acronym in a different way you know yeah. because people listen at it and uh i'm sure most people now understand that a lot of projects are it's black, Asian, mixed ethnicity and refugee. Yeah. Uh, and though it's being added to all the time and things like that. But the fact that you've used that acronym and made it more inclusive, yeah. you know, and varied rather than just saying it's it's for a specific group, you know, I thought that was important just to get out there. Yeah, but definitely, I mean, everybody's, I mean, like, like integrating the communities, I think that's a good thing to uh, integrate so we have a better understanding and learn a lot as well about different cultures. Well, Manchester, I mean, again, me and Paul talk about this all the time. Greater Manchester, everybody in it is is an immigrant. You know, there's no, you know, my my background, I think I've got Polish, some Nigerian in my family and uh, Irish, you know, and it's it really annoys me when this, and especially with um, identity politics at the moment at a national level, is causing division rather than sharing those that amazing thing of all the different... I mean, look at Greater Manchester, look at all the amazing people that have come to Greater Manchester and made it better, mm. you know? Um, never mind just the NHS and, the you know, all the different... You'll know yourself because you work there, you know, and my partner's a, a, a ward manager. The place would have shut down years ago without people coming from the Philippines, coming from South Asia, coming from... Uh, African countries, you know, France, Spain, you know, in some ways, I feel we sort of steal some of the best people from those other countries to, to for the NHS, you know, and it it's getting that through. I mean, we have a project to welcome to Greater Manchester, and it, it that's a very varied sort of theme that we do, but it's uh, accepting that and discussing it, and you know, and I've. Personally, I mean, what's your view on this? I, any opportunity to discuss and debate difference rather than avoiding it, you know? Yeah, definitely, yeah. I agree with that. Well, that way you can celebrate it, you know, yeah, and that's got to be the – it's not acceptance, it's celebration, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so working – you said mentioned earlier you work in the NHS. Yes. Could you tell us a bit about that? How did you get yeah. into that? Um, so when I used to work for the uh, local MP, um, after the general elections, um, James Fitz lost his seat, um, so I got made redundant. So I'd be looking for another job, and um, it took me a good six months applying for lots of different jobs. Like I applied for 64 jobs and had like six, seven interviews, and I think it was on the seventh interview that I got a, um, an interview for working on the NHS. And it was in the local hospital where um, I was born, my children were born, so I had a strong connection. And it's also in the ward that I represent as well, in East Ward. Um, so I did start as a ward clerk there on Ward 7, which is like the acute medical unit. 
and I loved it. Um, but then you're smiling. You probably do you realize you're smiling when you're saying this. Since you started talking about the NHS, you got a big smile on your face. You've gone right into the thick of it now. You've moved yeah. over to A and E now, haven't you? Yeah, I'm really passionate about it. Yeah, I've worked for the A and E now on the on the remain reception. So um, I've only been there. It's my I've, it's my third week to be honest, and um, I think I find it fascinating, and um, because I think it's really up my street because. Uh, the quality that I have, being very empathetic and a good listener, I think that is something really important that you need to be uh, working on an a and e reception. And also, because it's fast-paced as well, you'll actually be on it as well. Because, um, as I mentioned before, um, not only you've got your front window that you're looking at, booking people in, you've got the emergency ambulances coming as well behind you. So you've got to book them as well. So it's all go like, and um, even I'm going to do like an eight hour shift, it feels like I'm only just in two hours. It just goes past so quick. And I've got yeah. a lot of support. There, Can we so. say, on behalf, we do this all the time. We've just had uh, two exhibitions uh, on the NHS. And I said to them uh, when we opened it in Great Manchester, um, it was it was a real honour to have uh, so many people from uh, ICU from Wigan there. And I said to them, we did this because we love you and we care about you and we still support you. You know, never mind clap for carers. This has got to be a 24-7, 365 days a year support. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. thank you to you oh. and your colleagues because, you know, people think it's the surgeons, the consultants and everything. When somebody's in real distress or coming in with a child or something, you're the first person they see, mm. you know. And, I mean, I just sent a shiver down with there thinking of the times that I've had to go in or I've took my kids in and you being the way you are and smiling and, <clears throat> and you know, empathic and stuff like that do not half make a difference. So thank you for that. Oh, no problem. I do get people saying that I've got a smiley voice on the phone as well, so that's really nice. <laughs> smiley voice. Has, has anybody has anybody recognised you? Has anybody come in and, and done like a <laughs> double a take? Couple, a couple, I've person. seen you before. I was like, well, um, when you've seen me, um, you look like the lady on the poster, so it's like, you know, um, I'm their counsellor. But uh, there's a lot of people that know me in the community as well saying that, oh, you know, they do, do a double do take. Do you know what? How many people would think that the counsellor is also on reception, uh, you know, because you, 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 some people, I mean, I probably wouldn't, you think, well, no, no, they'll be living in the big mansion. <laughs> the councillors will be living, you know, doing all the, all that. And you think, no, that's, that's proper. I mean, I'm, I'm, you can't get any more grassroots than, than NHS and welcoming people, welcoming people in all sorts of situations coming into that building. Yeah. Yeah, different uh... situations. Yeah, some that you never ever imagine as well. Like, but I mean, having you got to be really um, confident to be able to speak to them, and you know, because they do have like a bit of a screening before they come to you. Like, if they're going to the urgent treatment centre, they're coming to yourself. So sometimes something's written down, like what, what they've come for, and have so you can't have those expressions on your face, as, although you're shocked. You've got to, yeah. you know, be professional. Like, you know, yeah, I wouldn't last five minutes. <laughs> I really would. All sorts. I mean, I'm too nosy. What? You've what? <laughs> <laughs> you did, did you manage that? But, well, uh, yeah, it, no, is that wrong with you? It's a cut. Here's a plaster. Get on. Yeah, here's a plaster. Just giving out plasters. <laughs> oh, I've had worse than that. Let me tell you about the time. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's rewarding to be honest, guys. It's really rewarding, you know. Mm. And I wouldn't change for anything. I mean, I get people saying that, why do you need to work when you've got, you're a counsellor? But what people don't realise, you don't get a lot of money being a counsellor. You only get a set amount of money, you know. You do millions of hours, but you'll get so, so much money, in, you know, being a counsellor. So I do say that I need a job to pay my bills. <laughs> Yeah. So then you decided oh. to set up a charity as well. That it wasn't a bright thing to do, was it? Because you're doing exactly the same there as well. <laughs> You've, you've just got to make sure, and I say this, and I don't always take my own advice. Well, I very rarely take my own advice, but, you you know, when you're doing all this kind of stuff and you do get, you know, when I say carried away with it, you just get stuck away with it because you realise there's so much to do. Yeah. There's, there's so much out there that needs someone like you or someone like me, people like me and Damien, and I'll say that quite openly, to do something about it, you know, and, and, yeah. and then you're kind of thinking, well, if I don't do it, no, who else is going to do it? And there are there's plenty of other people out there, but you've you've got to be really careful that you don't try and take on the world. Yeah, because 
you know, like, you know, during the pandemic, I mean, children had to homeschool. Yeah, there's children out there that don't have a tablet or an iPad, and mm. the school can only provide so much. So that's where I thought of the initiative of Education Station. So I applied for some funding from Forever Manchester and got um, some money to buy some um, tablets for kids to do their schoolwork. About 80 tablets we, we purchased for kids wow. to do their schoolwork at home. 80? You know, 80, 80 tablets? 80, yeah. Wow. So it's it's them things like there's a, there's a need like how we're we gonna get this help out there you know so um, you know <laughs> so it's not just my ideas it's it's my children as well they support me it's like for example our Lily Pad initiative which is um, we're supporting women with period poverty you know we were delivering food packs because that's nothing that we do um, we give food packs to people you know but it's, they're all um, cultural appropriate so we've got like um, uh, special dietary requirement for Asian um, household so we have like the spices and the dals and the rice for Avia. and uh, when we were delivering them um one of the ladies wanted some old clothes to use as sanitary products and i thought this isn't, can't be right so i thought you know i'll provide some pads but from there on we brought this initiative of providing free sanitary products to women you know and it has grown um we have actually um started uh, providing uh, lily lily, bo- lily pad boxes uh, in community groups and in schools now as well so girls don't feel embarrassed as well asking for such item, you know. See, I, you know, I, I openly admit, as as the dad of three boys, you know, period poverty wouldn't be on my wouldn't be on my radar. You know, it's only over the last few years, and obviously, and from the charity side, there's quite a few organisations who are doing that. And you, and you do, you think, well, why, why, why should we, you know, why should we be doing this? Why, why were this? Why were they taxed? Mm. You know, and I know they're not now, but bloody hell, they had to jump through enough hoops, yeah, to get it sorted. And it's 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 stuff like that which is which is so annoying because it's it's a, such a simple thing. Yeah, to, so like the to, asylum seekers, Paul, they've got they get like thirty five to thirty seven pound a week, and they've got to decide what to spend that money on yeah. on food, on toiletries, hygiene stuff, or clothes to wear. Mm. You know, and make that decision is so hard for them. You know, so I thought if we did something to help people, you know, I mean, it's not just for asylum seekers that we do now, Lily Pad, but it's for anybody. And I've had a lot of support in the community for that. We've had lots of donations coming through the supermarkets as well. They've run collections for us as well. So it's been really, really positive. And how good is that? You just mentioned as well the cultural specific issues. And again, I've wrote a lot of bids for lots of different groups over the last sort of couple of years, and it's. Only through doing that that I became more and more sort of aware of the cultural specific needs, you know. Yeah. And it's when you think of a food bank, you know, and the, things are changing. Uh, just generally, they're talking more about food ladders rather than food banks where people can go and actually choose, you yeah. know. Just the My thing of yeah. somebody going in and how, yeah, because going in and going, here you go, and you get home and you're like, I don't eat fish fingers. You know, I don't, what can I do with this, <laughs> if you know what I mean? Mm. When yeah. just giving people that dignity of having stuff that they could actually, I mean, for instance, I, if I came on with a, a food bank stuff and it didn't have spices in it, I'd, I wouldn't be happy because, you know, I make a lot of stuff that's, um, I love cooking sort of different foods from, the, you know, different regions, and I, I like a bit of flavour in my food. You know, and, and it's removing people's dignity by doing just giving them bland stuff. Do you know what I mean? If they like bland stuff, that's up to them. That's their choice. You know, well, that is giving people choice. You wouldn't necessarily think of that. You know, I wouldn't necessarily think of that. I mean, I get told that all the time. <laughs> you know, you know, it's like, well, you wouldn't. You, could, you, you know, you, you you need to be. You need to hear that somebody's done it, for you to realise it's a sensible thing to do. Yeah. And and you know, if someone listens to this podcast, obviously someone will listen to it, even if it's just us three. Um, but if someone listens to this podcast and thinks, Yeah, bloody hell, that, that we're not doing that. <laughs> Why aren't we doing that? Then? I remember talking to that old Jamaican guy, I mean, he must have been in his sixties in a homeless hostel. And do you remember when we were there talking, when we're just asking people, what do you need? What do you want? What would you like to do? And everyone's going, nobody's ever asked us this before. And um, the old Jamaican guy was saying to him, what do you miss more? What would you want? He said, cookie. He said, all the food that I get. He said, it's fantastic that I can go to these different places and get food. 
he said, I just miss something with flavour. You know, and I, the more I talked to him, he said, I said, can you cook? He said, I'm a fantastic chef. He said, I love cooking and stuff. And unfortunately, that was just before the pandemic started because I said to him, can we can we help you set up something like a food project where you teach other people, you know, how to cook with different different foods, different spices, different. And he said, oh, I'd love to, but it's only through that thing of sitting down with someone saying, what would you like? Mm. What do you miss? What do you need? Yeah. You know, yeah. but that's, that to me, it leads to the culturally sort of responsive solutions. You know, you're tailoring it to the individual rather than just here's a, here's a missionary solution. You know what I mean? It doesn't mm. work, does yeah. it? No. Sorry, I went off on one in a minute. Now, but, uh... See, we, we we always come back to food. We always come back to food. <laughs> I'm on a diet at the moment. I'm not eating. So, listen is is there any is there anything that I mean? You, I know when we we spoke um, a little while back that you were you were you were looking. I don't, and again, we you know this may go and it may not depending on on where you are with it. But you you were looking at the um, getting some money for the building that you've got. I, I, yeah, I'm still looking for um, um, fundraising bids. Um, I am going to look at Damien for that, so I'm actually yeah, going to get should. contact with him. Hey, Amir, drop me an email. There's a, few, there's, there's a few funding applications that have come through now, so um, I'll what I'll do is um, send them forward to yourself on your email. I think I've got your email address. And then if you could help me, I'd really, really appreciate that help. Whatever you need, you sustain us in the same building, yeah, because... Um, obviously we've only got the rent till March and it'll be a shame if we could not pay the rent and uh, have to disperse somewhere else like nowhere. Well again we'll make that something that we raise and we try and because if we try, I suppose if we try and raise too many things during the festival people people will just forget mm. probably, I mean I don't know, you you tell us if you, if you think that wants to be the main thing that you're looking to do which is you know you've worked really hard to to build that base yeah and, it, and it's and it's so yeah. helpful to so many people so to lose it would be like it'd be like you know stepping back wouldn't it, it um would so yeah we we will absolutely and we can have another chat about that next week um but yeah i mean we you you tell you tell us use it as an opportunity to tell us what you're looking for uh and we will badger as many people as we can the offer's um, there if you want to retain your independence and do it on your own, and we'll support you in that. Um, or if you want to partner up with us as Manx Spirit as a legacy project of the festival, then we'll come and do it. We'll come and run it with you as a partner. You know, and that's that's respecting your independence and what you've built up, not taking over. We're not into that. You know, we've we wouldn't know where to start. Do you, well, what you're you're doing far too doing far too much don't you be offering our services we don't have any time to do anything else it was the whole idea of this festival you know going out finding people out there that are doing amazing things and offering support you know because mm. collaboration is the only way forward things are going to yeah. get harsher um from here on in you know furloughs stopped um a lot more people are going to lose their jobs the you know you've got um you know, you mentioned period poverty, but the there's going to be fuel poverty. You know, we're going into a winter here where people just are going to have to make a choice of putting the the heating on or eating. Food on the table, yeah, of course. And it's disgusting, and it, we shouldn't be in this position. So, Not in this country, I know it's it's really really shocking. You know, it's shocking. Well, the way the way of dealing with that is exactly what you do and exactly what we do, which is sod the politicians sod everybody else we'll we'll crack on we'll make it happen you know we might not be able to deal with everything it, you know yeah. some of these things are too big an issue but we'll we'll have a chip at it and we'll deal with the bit that we can do you yeah. know what i mean do you know what by, by working together we'll, we can make it happen more you know you know sometimes it's not you, you get to the point where you think well maybe it's not shocking enough because it's it's still an issue and no one's doing it. You know, it, it's not being dealt with as much as it as it should be. So, you know, that's where we need to we need to highlight it and we need to show show, show people. It's why we do. You know, trigger when people talk about trigger warnings, uh, and I get them to a certain extent. But the thing is, if you put trigger warnings on everything, nobody knows what's going on in the world, mm. and and you won't do anything about it. Um, and and that's what we want to do is show everyone 
or point everyone in your direction, not everyone in Greater Manchester, but people who are who are local to you to 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 point them in your direction and say there is somebody who's trying to do something about it. And yeah. you know, if we have to embarrass other people to, to fund it and yeah. get behind it. To be honest, I mean, what I've started doing is actually asking local businesses to sponsor me from three pound a month at least. You know, three pound is pennies really for some people, but um, I mean, we've been lucky. So where we are actually based, um, Newtons, um, I told them about my gazebo most recently. It broke, um, and they've actually um, told me find one, and then they're paying for half, and somebody else is paying for half. So. I mean, it's about five hundred pounds. The one that we've got, the gazebo, like. But it's some people that are willing to help. So I mean, yeah. but it's getting the word out there because, to be honest, I am a bit shy sometimes asking, you know, for, for the help from local business. You don't, you don't strike me <laughs> as the shy type. <laughs> you really don't. Well, for I mean, other stuff. I am a bit, you know, but um, yeah. But it's like, but what it is at the moment, doing applications for fundings, I think you need that time, don't you, to sit down and actually get the wording right. And to be honest with you, as you know, that like, I'm not getting that time. Mm. it's also um we're going to do it and we have a review period every now and then because we we're involved in that many different things and we're passionate about trying to help and try to be reactive all the time to things that are coming up and we can't do everything um mm. so again you know after after each festival and we're going to do it again after the berry festival me and paul are going to take a week or two out stop everything for not stop the projects the projects are still running but stop creating new ones new ones and just come back and go right what is the jigsaw which bits can we do which groups do we now know out there like yourself like you know the nurses over in Wigan the carers over in Trafford the we've met so many fantastic groups through doing these festivals that we mm. didn't know were out there so we're just going to sit back and look at what the jigsaw is, but then look at, as you said earlier, look in the gaps of provision. You know, yeah. is there something there we could get somebody from another borough to, you know, so for instance, if there was a project in, in say, Wigan that needed domestic uh, violence support, we'd come to you and say, can we work with you to expand it over there? If we can't do that, then we'll do it ourselves. You know, we'll just create it. <laughs> yeah. So it it is taking that time and you can easily get so involved in so many things and you've got so much on your plate at the moment that sometimes it's more strategic to just go, well, actually, we're going to stop that project, but we'll put more energy into this one. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, just on the recent, that the social event that I did on Saturday, I mean, that was like a three, four month uh, prep that I did. Um, Obviously, it goes over like three, four hours and you think, wow, you know, but... There's a lot of work that went behind that, and I've actually built my um, bar quite high now because everybody's loved that. And there's a lot of people that said that we didn't know about this event. I was like, well, it was on my social media, you know. Mm. But it's having the guest speakers and who are also passionate and very inspirational women that came. And the women had a fantastic time because during the pandemic, they've not been able to socialise or meet other people. And they had the opportunity to do that on Saturday night, and, and they loved every aspect of it. And they brought a bit of fun and games into it as well. Like, you won't believe it, we had musical chairs as well, and the women loved it. They, they were very competitive, and even the, <laughs> even the judges, the, the honoured honourable guests, they joined in as well because they found it fun. So, yeah, just I've seen story, the pictures. You know. I've, again, you know, I've seen the pictures, and it's everything I come to expect now, which is just people enjoying themselves. It's it's one of them things if you don't have to reinvent everything. You've got enough yeah. ideas. You've got enough projects out there. Mm. You know, you'll always think of new ones, but you need that space to think about them as well. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So if we can help, if we can connect you with people, um, me and Paul will always support you. So, you know, we're here, users. Um, but give us a shout when you've got some availability and I'll come and sit down with you and we'll go through a load of stuff. Brilliant. Right. Yeah. Thank, okay, thanks yeah. for this. It's been an absolute pleasure talking <laughs> no to you. Now, go and have a rest. <laughs>